Turn it up on whatever device it is you're listening to this here podcast. It's the Weekly Trim Podcast with yours, Beardly, the one and only Redbeard. Or at least the only guy who calls himself Redbeard over the next 10 square miles or so. How you doing there, folks? Good to have you on this, the August 15th episode of the weekly trim here on the Rassim with Redbeard YouTube channel. Oh man, I'm in a good mood here this evening. It's been a good couple of days. Coming off of a good weekend where we were able to see some wrestling in a number of different towns and a lot of different uh, talent on those shows. Not only some local talent, but also got to attend the WWE event. Pretty cool. Pretty awesome stuff all the way around in terms of just the number of events that were here in the Carolinas over the past couple of days because it was a real example of how fortunate we are as fans in this area to attract the kind of attention that we do from various, not only independent companies, but also major companies. Uh, you know, we get WWE events here a couple times a year usually. Some areas, maybe they get one stop a year through there. We just, you know, we're fortunate in that we've got a lot of opportunities for the company to use us as kind of a thoroughfare in getting to other parts of the world. I know that uh, it was quite common for them to use Charleston as a jumping off point to some of their European tours because of the fact that there's a nice airport there in Charleston. And of course, Charleston is Charleston in terms of having plenty of hotels and accommodations and just being very welcoming to travelers, period. But, you know, over the past couple of days, I've also just had a really good opportunity to enjoy modern convenience. And I'm getting into this idea of mobile ordering. And I know this is not anything new. I know it's not something that is necessarily all that uncommon these days. But it was uncommon to me until here a couple of weeks ago when you know we were in Nashville. And I, I think I described on that episode of the podcast where I described our trip there, um, the fact that I used a mobile ordering service called DoorDash um, that allows you to contact a restaurant and then one of their drivers will bring you your food. And I did that, and I guess that might have sort of tipped the scale towards me being a fan of these types of services, because from there, my wife and I, we had a crazy awesome experience. I described it as amazeballs on Facebook. I wouldn't normally use the term amazeballs, but I did, because it was just an, an amazing experience to me in terms of how convenient it was in eliminating, I'll say, the negative overhead that comes with a visit to a store like Walmart. Now, you know, everybody has their negatives about Walmart. Seems like everybody has a negative experience with most vendors or most retailers, period. Ours with Walmart have been particularly bad. I'll go ahead and say we've had some pretty bad experiences with Walmart over the years. But be that as it may, my wife here a week or so ago downloaded the app that allows you to actually submit a custom order to your local Walmart store. They'll prepare it in advance for you, have it ready at a certain period of time, and you don't even have to notify them of when you're there because guess what? This app is GPS enabled. So when you arrive at the designated time period at that location, your mobile device sends a signal across the system and lets the folks in the store know, hey, our customer is out there waiting for their food or waiting for whatever. Because guess what? They'll bring you, I think, whatever out to the car. I don't think it's necessarily just groceries. I might be wrong. Please don't go ordering a bucket of Legos or a PlayStation 4 
and expect them to bring it to your car. I'm sure there's probably some other, you know, set of circumstances to where you can only have certain things brought to your car. But still, for a person like my wife, if she had our son in the car, or if she knew she was going to be in need of something a couple of days out for an event or whatnot, and wanted to pick it up on the way, very convenient in that she can pull into one of those parking spaces, have someone bring it to the car, and whoop, she's off going on about her day, doing whatever she needed to be doing. And the same for someone like myself, in ordering, as I did here this evening, a order of food from Zaxby's. I had wings, and I had, believe it or not, I had wings and a side order of celery. Why did I have a side order of celery? I'll tell you why. Because my wife and my son are not here, and I can have crunchy food that my wife hates while she's not here. And that's exactly what I did. I had a nice batch of celery with some ranch dressing and just, you know, enjoyed that opportunity to have a little little bit of vegetable. Uh, Granted, of course, celery is not going to do a whole lot for you in terms of providing sustenance. But still, I was able to enjoy a nice piece of crunchy food because I had the opportunity to do so thanks to the fact that I went to Zaxby's, quickly retrieved my food, came back home, ate dinner, did a little bit of a chore here at the house, and now I'm sitting here recording a podcast for you fine folks. This is how convenient we are here in this day and age. We don't have flying cars. We don't have a lot of stuff that we were promised by the Jetsons and by, you know, Doc Brown whenever he went to 2015 with Marty McFly in Back to the Future Part 2. But guess what? I can order chicken wings. I can order a gallon of milk and three packs of eggs if I want to from Walmart and I can have it prepared and ready for me without having to encounter people and it's amazing because there are some times in life where I just don't want to encounter people I just really don't and these conveniences are allowing us to have those experiences of where we can get what we need and get on with life and that's great because guess what The more opportunities we have to get on with life, the better off we are. And guess what? Beyond that, I had a lot of life this past weekend and this past couple of days in general. Because you know me, you know how much I enjoy wrestling, you know how much I enjoy the opportunity to get out to shows, and that's what I really had an opportunity to have or to do here the past couple of days. I'll start with the most recent event that we attended. My wife and I went to the Colonial Life Arena, which is in Columbia, South Carolina, last night for the WWE Live SummerSlam Heat Wave Tour. I'm not sure why they just couldn't call it WWE Live. I guess they had to remind people that SummerSlam is coming up this weekend, but be that as it may, the show was really awesome. I, you know, I, there have been times where I have looked at WWE events, especially uh, the TV tapings, to where they've not been really all that valuable in terms of the experience that I had at them. I look back at them as if to say, eh, that was eh, that was mild at best in terms of what I enjoyed out of that whole thing there. But this event, I will say, was very good. Uh, it was very entertaining the entire time. Uh, there was a great combination of talent. This is a show that was a part of the SmackDown brand in terms of the touring schedule. Um, they they do still have the, the brand split. However, when it comes to pay-per-views and network specials, everybody's kind of in the same boat. But for this one, it was just SmackDown talent. Uh, to go over the card, it started off hot and heavy with a tag team match as the New Day, which were represented by Kofi Kingston and Xavier Woods, had Big E out there on the outside, of course, defeated The Bar, Cesaro and Sheamus. I, you know, I was kind of surprised to see Cesaro and Sheamus because I was uh, I was almost under the impression that Sheamus wasn't competing very much anymore. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I will admit that I don't watch SmackDown or Raw that much anymore just because my schedule doesn't really allow it. But be that as it may, I, I thought... Seamus was dealing with a bit of a back injury. Someone had mentioned potentially even spinal stenosis or something like that, which I thought was what led to Edge's career having been cut short. I may be totally wrong there, but I was very glad to see them there because they are two of my favorite guys in the entire company. I love them as a tag team. It's great to see them competing. And unfortunately, they didn't win, but they still put on a good show. Very entertaining opener there. 
Then they followed that up with a contest between Aiden English and the local boy himself, Shelton Benjamin. Shelton Benjamin, if you are not aware, was born and raised in Orangeburg, South Carolina. For the most part, I think he's normally announced as being from Minnesota because that's where he attended college. Uh, however, he was born and raised here in South Carolina. So when Aiden English came out last night and was talking about beating up one of our local South Carolina competitors, I thought for a brief second, okay, well, could he be talking about one of our local indie guys? No, it was Shelton Benjamin. <laughs> I totally forgot that Shelton was on the roster because he was he spent a, a good bit of time in Japan after he was released by WWE here a couple of years ago and had been doing great things over there. But he's back with them, the uh, company now, and uh, he did defeat Aiden English, so he got over on him pretty good there. Then moving on from that match, we had a big contest in the form of a WWE United States Championship match where Shinsuke Nakamura defeated Randy Orton and Jeff Hardy. Uh, you have to say that there was not a whole lot of effort put into this match by these three. They kind of just went out there and did what they were going to do, especially on the case of Orton and Jeff Hardy. I, you know, I hate to say that, but Jeff especially, I just you get the sense there's not much left in the tank for, for Jeff, unfortunately. Uh, I think that when he and Matt came back, they were really excited and really ready to go as far as renewing things. But now with them split up on different rosters and not even tagging together anymore, I, I just wonder if that really hasn't pampered him in some way, shape, or form. Um, but, you know, I may be totally wrong. It might be just a, a way he's presenting himself right now. But, uh, but moving on from there, uh, went into a intergender tag team match as Rusev and Lana defeated Andrade Cien Almas and Selena Vega. A great, again, a great combination of talent in these matches. A lot of talent in these matches, period, when you consider the fact that you had a three-way dance there for the United States Championship featuring three of the top stars in the company, and then following that up with a uh, intergender tag team match featuring even more big stars from the uh, the brand there. And I was very entertained by the back and forth uh, with Rusev and Andrade, Cien Almas. I've been a fan of, if you're not familiar, Almas before he came to WWE was La Sombra in uh, Mexico. But it was a big fan of his when he was still working under the mask. Still am a big fan of his now in the company. I can think back to a couple of years ago when I was at an NXT event and Almas and Austin Aries had as perfect a match as I have really ever seen live. I wish that video of that match existed. I'm sure it does somewhere in the catalog of content that WWE has because they film all their stuff. But man alive, what a great match those two had. And really what great things uh, Almas has done since then. I'm hoping he gets a, a, a further opportunity as things continue to grow for him here. He's got a good thing going with Selena Vega, so hopefully it'll continue to grow for the both of them. Uh, we had intermission after this. Of course, you have the mass pee break exodus of people leaving the arena to try and go get something to drink, relieve themselves come back and get their seats before the next part of the show starts. In looking around, you know, I always try, when I go to shows, I try and estimate attendance at these things. It's such a big building, it's really hard to get a, a, a gauge of what was available and what wasn't in there in terms of the price structures and, and what have you, because the the seats that were more expensive, obviously, were not selling very well. The seats, however, that were lower cost were almost sold out entirely, and we were in one of those lower cost sections. And you know, the thing about it is, it you have a, a great vantage point. You're not right up there on the ring, but you can still see everything. Um, and it's like I've told my wife and others before: if I'm not on the front row, I would almost sooner be at the top of the lower bowl because guess what? I can get up at that point and I can go to the bathroom. I can go get a drink. I can be convenienced here again by the proximity of where my seat is to those things that I actually need and want in that experience. So, again, in looking at attendance, not a very good house, but they don't really probably expect a house on a Monday night in the Midlands of South Carolina to be all that great, especially when school had started back for a lot of kids. Um, it was probably between 1,500 and 2,000 people, maybe a little bit more, but I, definitely not less than that, but it's, it's somewhere in that area, I would say for sure. 
Um, then after intermission, we got into the top three matches on the card. You had a match that started off as a singles competition for the uh, SmackDown brand women's championship that then metamorphosed into a six-woman tag team match where you had Becky Lynch, Asuka, and Charlotte Flair defeating Carmella and the Iconics. The Iconics, of course, are Peyton Royce and Billy Kay, a couple of uh, talents that are still relatively new. They weren't too long ago called up from NXT. Uh, and they're still getting there, but you know the combination of them and Carmella, n- not the most talent in the world, especially when you're looking across at Asuka and Charlotte Flair on the same team. Yeah, that'd be a lot to deal with. But moving on from there, a lot of a lot of uh, tag team matches on this card. A lot of the belts and whatnot were up for grabs here as well. Uh, next match, for example, you had the SmackDown Tag Team Championship was up for grabs, but the Bludgeon Brothers did retain Harper and Rowan, probably two of the scariest guys on the entire roster at this point in time. They were able to defeat the club. I think they're still going by the club, that being uh, Luke Gallows and Kevin Anderson. Um, and um, just, excuse me, Luke Gallows and Anderson there uh, representing the club. And that was a, a really cool matchup from the standpoint that you've got all these big dudes there in that ring. Gallows, Luke Harper, Eric Rowan, all guys who were 6'5 plus. And Anderson, you know, Ken Anderson, he's not a a small guy either. It's really just cool to see that combination of talent in there, uh, especially when you consider the fact that uh, Gallows and Anderson, you know, forever, they were probably the top tag team in the world there for a couple of years. And they're still, you know, pecking away at things. They're going to get back there eventually, but not just yet. And then main event time. What a great match, and what a storied history between these two guys as we had AJ Styles defeating Samoa Joe to retain the WWE Championship. And here again, you know, you talk about two guys who have been up and down the road with each other, beating each other to a pulp in God knows how many towns and cities all over the world, all over the country. And you couldn't think of two better examples of that than them. Just an amazing set of stories. And an amazing match by two guys who, of course, know each other incredibly well. Uh, so overall, a great show. Seven matches. Could not say a bad thing about it in terms of the overall experience. The only negative to the entire evening was, I'll go ahead and say, the parking situation at Colonial Life Arena. You know, these tickets and whatnot, they're already pretty expensive as is. Because you're paying face value plus you then have to pay whatever they stick on there in terms of charges and fees and this, that, and the other. And, you know, we had $20 tickets that wind up costing almost $35 a piece after the fees get applied. And then we pull into the, the lot there the other night, and normally they have a sign as you enter the lot to let you know, fans who are coming in know how much it's going to be. Usually it's about ten bucks to park. Last night it was twenty dollars, twenty dollars just to leave our car somewhere. And I had people, you know, I posted on my Facebook page about how I couldn't believe it was twenty dollars to park the car. And I had people say, "Oh, well, you should have uh, parked on the street. It's free parking in Columbia after five p.m." Well, whatever. There's no parking in the range of where we're at here at the Colonial Life Arena. You're gonna walk two blocks or two miles, whatever it is and then hope your car's fine whenever you get back there. And then I had a friend of mine who shared, well, you, you could have parked at our house and taken an Uber to you know the, the the venue there. That was something I didn't even consider. But guess what? It's going to be from now on because to hell with paying $20 to park the car. I could not believe that. That's the most inconvenient thing in the world. So as we go from talking about conveniences to being massively inconvenienced, there we go. Still had fun at the show, had a good time with my wife. It was like old times, she and I sitting there enjoying wrestling. <sighs> Looking back, you know, it's crazy to think we've been married for almost 10 years here now. We've known each other for 10 years as of uh, here in the next couple of weeks. And one of the first big date night type things that we ever went on was to see wrestling. And we don't go to wrestling that much more together anymore. Um, but it was pretty cool to be able to have that moment with her. It was a, a nice little date night. So it is what it is. And 
next, we're going to be talking even more wrestling as I'm going to be coming back here in a few moments to regale you folks with my experience at Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling's Kershaw Clash. Be back in a few, folks. Thanks for joining us here on the Weekly Trim. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you for continuing to hang out with us here on the Rassel and Redbeard YouTube channel. This is the Weekly Trim Podcast. I am your host, Redbeard. We're talking wrestling. What else would we be talking about, of course, here on this wrestling-heavy program? But it's also, of course, a life podcast, of other people, as other people have said about their shows over the years. Um, but, you know, past couple of days, as I said in the opening segment there, we've seen a lot of wrestling. So we're going to talk about it, another experience we had. This one was this past Saturday at the Camden High School in Camden, South Carolina on August 11th of 2018. Uh, we had a, uh, we'll say a tour stop by Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling. MACW is a company that's a little bit weird in how they do things because they travel around, they do what kind of amount to little spot shows in various towns and whatnot. They never are really in the same place twice in any stretch of time. Um, I couldn't tell you the last time they were in the Camden area. They, I think they were in Darlington, South Carolina earlier this year, and they might have been towards 
Sumter or somewhere maybe a year or so ago. But they've, they've come back around this part of the world again and had a, a, a pretty decent show, we'll say. Um, there was some controversy going into this show because there were some, some barbs, we'll say, traded by a couple of local promoters, or at least one promoter in general, about whether or not this particular company, and I'm talking about MACW, was behaving on the up and up when it came to how they were trying to acquire sponsors and that they also evidently may have had someone who was out and about in the Kershaw area tearing down posters from other companies and putting theirs up in their place. Whether or not that's true, I have no idea. All I can say is that it's been something that's been going around the local scene here. You've got people talking about this, that, and the other. When you have your ear to the ground for stuff like I do when it comes to the local wrestling scene, you hear of this stuff, and you, I would hope that this isn't true. But do I think it's possible? Certainly. However, you know, it's one of those things where it's not my business because I'm not a promoter. I'm just a fan. If it happened... Bad form for sure to those of you who are involved in that kind of thing, but guess what? That's kind of the promotion business. I hate to say it, but especially in the realm of indie wrestling, people are very petty, or they can be anyway, so it just kind of is what it is. People are going to tear down posters. People are going to put flyers on cars for another show while you're at a certain show. It just it just happens. You know, it's just kind of the way business is in this area. But be that as it may, the controversy around the show didn't seem to have deterred anyone because there was a really big turnout for this show. I would say in the area of 500 to 550 in terms of the actual crowd here. But the, the real draw to this show, you know, it's not like your typical indie show where you've got well-known guys from this area. This was definitely a nostalgia event. This was a show where the draw was the legends that were on hand. And they were great to see because you had the Steiner brothers, Rick and Scott. You had Ricky Steamboat there. Several other talents that were on hand. They're well-known throughout this region. Um, it was just really cool to see them because you, you have to, you know, with, over the past couple of days here, we, we unfortunately we've lost another wrestling legend in the form of Jim the Anvil Neidhart. So it's just unfortunate, but you have to stop and think and really consider you know, some of these older stars, how much longer are they going to be around? You know, because not to say that Steamboat is particularly all that old, or Rick and Scott for that matter, but, you know, they're they're not spring chickens anymore, and neither am I for that matter. But if you have an opportunity to see some of these people, to encounter some of these heroes from your youth, definitely take advantage of it, because you never know. They they might not be here forever. Well, they definitely won't be here forever. But their forever might come sooner than yours. So just, you know, take an opportunity, spend 20 bucks, meet one of your heroes, have a good time talking to them for five or ten minutes, and then go, you know, go enjoy a show, which is exactly what a majority of the people in attendance for this show did because there was a huge line coming around the uh, the merchandise area there pretty much from the moment the doors opened until the show began. Um, now, I will say that uh, the show was fun in terms of the matches, but we're definitely not really here for the matches. As we said, this is a nostalgia event. Um, so there were matches, but the matches that were there were, you know, I hate to say it, but they were second fiddle to the opportunity to meet some of these guys. But even as that is the case, let's go over the card here and we'll talk about what happened um, therein as we go through this whole thing. Uh, opening match, you had Cowboy Mason Moore defeating Zuka King. Zuka King um, is a young man who is holding three belts at this point in time. He's uh, tag team champion at Russell Force and Old School Championship Wrestling, and he's the current heavyweight champion at Action Pack Wrestling in Chester. So Zuka three belts, I think, is what they're calling him right now, um, and well worth it though because Zuka has made a lot of progress in a very short period of time. Uh, next matchup, you had the Son of Light Elijah Proctor defeating Bobby Ballantyne. One thing I want to highlight about this match was that the you know the, there's not a in this style of show you don't have a whole lot of big time action. You've got a very traditional presentation here. Um, so when Bobby Ballantyne hit a big drop kick on Elijah Proctor, the crowd went nuts. And that was like, wow, 
we're in 2018, and a drop kick will get that kind of reaction from a crowd. It's great to see that the old school stuff still works. So it was a pretty cool moment to see the crowd rise up and react to something as simple as a drop kick. That was pretty cool, I thought. Uh, moving on from there was the match of the night, and this was the reason why I chose to attend this event over something in like Georgia or somewhere else in the Carolinas. You had a first time ever meeting between the Heat Seekers, who are the current MACW Tag Team Champions, and the Lynch Mob. Of course, the Heat Seekers are Matt Sigmund and Elliot Russell, the Lynch Mob brothers Joey and Matt Lynch. This was a great match. I have to say that I wish they'd been given a little bit more time because this was about 15 minutes. You know, when they go over the rules in these contests, they always say, well, you have a 45-minute time limit or whatever. I, if, I wish they could have gone 20 or 30 minutes because I think at that point in time, you could have had a nice protracted match where they could have really fought and ground on each other. But, you know, as it was, still a good match, still fun to watch. I just wish it had been longer because me being the fan that I am and appreciating these types of matches, for it to have been like, I think it was 12 or 13 minutes tops, maybe 15, it was like, ugh. I wanted more. <laughs> I, know, I know that sounds weird. I know it sounds odd in terms of trying to describe wrestling. But, you know, as a fan, you, you hate to see something end that could have been more than it was. And I'm sure these two teams will definitely encounter each other again in the future. You never know. It may be somewhere local here again, but I have a feeling it'll probably be somewhere in Georgia or Tennessee or somewhere like that, and we won't have an opportunity to see it live. It'll be something we have to catch on a streaming service or whatnot, but be that as it may, that was definitely the match of the night there. Uh, but intermission from that point in time, and again, I want to say it was in the area of about 550 or so people attending there. Definitely a big crowd. It was very full in there. Not packed to the gills, not hanging from the rafters, as they like to say, but still a lot of people and a very good show in there for sure. Um, one thing that was weird was that they, they didn't have the music of most of these stars configured correctly because there were several um, of these athletes who came out to, for example, ECW's old theme song. And I was like, what, what is this? Why are they doing this? So I don't know what happened there. I don't know if they didn't have the right music or if the guy running sound didn't know what he was doing or what, but it was funny to hear, for example, Bobby Valentine come out to ECW's theme. So, yeah. <laughs> but, but moving on from there, and looking at the rest of the card, you had uh, Buff Bagwell being challenged by Zane Riley. The Zane Riley, of course, being Mr. 305 Live, Zane Riley. I, it was funny in this contest because prior to the match, they were going back and forth verbally, trading tit for tat. And Bagwell, at one point in time, said to Riley, well, I've got something that you've never had, and that is... Uh, having been on TV, or I've done something you never have, which is being on TV. And then it was a little bit funny in that, guess what? Riley and Buff Bagwell have been on the exact same number of episodes of WWE Raw, which is one. <laughs> so I, I had to look that up, but I, I, I was certain that Buff had not been on many of them. But man alive, it was funny to have that kind of come back there after the fact. But yeah, uh, Bagwell did get the best of old Zane there. So unfortunately, Zane did not uh, get to defend himself too much in that matchup. But he definitely fared better than uh, in the. I'll say he fared better by the end of the night than he did just in that ep episode, because of the fact that he then was part of the finish of the main event, which is a match for the MACW Heavyweight Championship, which uh, the current champion is Johnny Swinger. You had him being challenged by uh, Scott Steiner. Steiner did win the match. However, he won by disqualification by virtue of Zane getting involved. So you had that whole combination of things there where Zane gets in, costs Steiner the title, Swinger still retains, and everybody kind of goes home somewhat happy because then Buff Bagwell comes out to make the save and our heroes are victorious even though they don't go home with a nice shiny belt over their shoulder. So, uh, looking back, was this show great? Was it really worth my time? Any of that type of thing there? Hey, it, it might have been worth my time, but realistically, 
it's going to be a hard sell to get me back to one of their shows. Because we're talking about the controversy with them pulling down posters and whatnot earlier. The the bigger thing to me is the fact that when MACW runs shows, they might put out a poster. However, they never announce matches. Going into this show, one of the Heat Seekers actually, I think, made a graphic and published it on his Facebook page saying, hey, this is, match is going to happen here at MACW. Come see us. If not for him and if not for that graphic, would have had no idea that that match was happening. So here again, if they would advertise their matches, if they would put more out there other than just saying, hey, these legends are going to be here, then, yeah, I think more people would come. But with them having things set up the way they are, I just don't know. Uh, it'll, it'll take some changes for me to get back to one of their shows for sure because I've been to two of them now, and the formula has been pretty much the same. So all that having been said, we're going to take another musical break here. We'll be back in a few minutes to talk some more stuff. But it's not going to be wrestle stuff. It's going to be football stuff because guess what? College football season, football season period, is almost here. We'll be back. Yeah. 
everybody. Thank you for continuing to hang out with us here on the Weekly Trim on the Rassimal Redbeard YouTube channel. If you are not already a subscriber, please do consider subscribing to our channel. We've got all kinds of cool stuff going on out here nowadays. We've been lucky enough to work with Chris Knighton, who was a producer over at the Blind Tag podcast. He's doing some interviews for us with some of the talent around this part of the world, so he's going to be continuing to contribute those. Of course, we've got tons of match videos. We were talking about Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling there in the previous segment. The matches, except for the main event, I did not record the main event, but every other match on that card is available in the match playlist that we've got here on the channel. Go check those out. If you enjoy what we're doing here, as we said, please consider subscribing. Give these videos and podcasts and whatnot a like. That way people will know that it's good stuff. And also, please continue to share this stuff around. We are really appreciative of the folks who are doing that and for the folks who are uh, you know, retweeting things that we put out on Twitter and whatnot. So it really means a lot to have something of a community that's continuing to build up around the channel here. And all that having been said, I want to get into talking about something that I'm also very passionate about other than wrestling, other than stuff like that, and that's football. I'm a big fan of the University of South Carolina Gamecocks. I am an alum of the university, so of course that doesn't make a whole lot of sense that I wouldn't be a big fan of the University of South Carolina Gamecocks football team, um, but of the athletics programs there in general, I'm a big fan of. And getting into football season here in the South, you know, it's a big deal. We're not so big into the NFL. You have pockets of NFL fans, but for the most part, it is big-time college football territory down here. And we are less than, let's say, two weeks away from the start of college football season. A lot going into the season right now in terms of the controversy over player safety and some things that have happened with a couple of coaches. Uh, And here in the past couple of days, the real big news has been a situation that's kind of erupted around the University of Maryland's uh, program because there was a a very unfortunate incident earlier this year, back around June, I want to say it was, where one of their offensive linemen, young man named Jordan McNair, uh, unfortunately, died as a result of uh, heat stroke type injuries. Um, I've read multiple reports that say that at the time of uh, the incident where he was pulled off the field, his internal temperature was in the area of 106 degrees. And evidently, I don't know the full science of this, but evidently if you get above around 104, uh, your body starts to experience all kinds of bad things. And this young man, uh, the, the university, unfortunately, has now admitted that this young man uh, did not receive proper care there on the field. They have a, uh, a, a sort of an emergency response plan that the trainers are to uh, adhere to in treating someone who's going through something like this, and they didn't do it. They evidently were trying to push these young men, and unfortunately, that's not uncommon, especially when you talk about something like football. I never really played that much in the way of football because my parents wouldn't allow me. Um, But you always heard stories of guys who were on football teams who got hurt and they played hurt or they extended themselves when they shouldn't have because of the fact that the culture around football is such that you're supposed to be this tough guy who can take anything and who you know doesn't have to take water breaks or whatever else. And, you know, it's just, it's one of those things where you don't have to be that guy anymore. Sure, it had the whole mythology behind it years ago, but guess what? We're, you know, we're a different society now. You don't have to be that thing anymore. You can still play football and be a normal human being. You don't have to be this kind of monstrous thing in order to try and make yourself to be a better player than you would be otherwise. So the the situation in Maryland there is just very unfortunate because again the young this young man did die, and it, it, evidently it was not the only example of a player who was part of that program who was pushed beyond their limit. Um, you have to say that at some point in time, I don't want to say the NCAA needs to step in and, and provide further regulation, but somebody's got to step in and say, hey, you know, we really have to do better as the people 
and I'm talking about coaches, strength and conditioning coaches in particular, because this was a this was not an official practice that this young man died at. I believe this was a a, um, a voluntary practice that he was involved with, and those are typically run by, uh, by not full members of the coaching staff, but by like a coordinator, for example, who can get away with sort of skirting the rules and saying, okay, well, this is a a quote-unquote practice, but not an official practice because the NCAA limits the amount of official practices these teams can have. But they do these things, and they try and get these guys roughed up and ready to go for the season and whatnot. And in a case like Maryland, there's been rumors of them taking it a little too far. And unfortunately, this player's death is proof of that. Um, they're, the coach there at Maryland is a, a man by the name of DJ Durkin. He right now is under administrative leave, um, paid administrative leave, we should say, um, until they come to a conclusion as to whether or not they're going to hire him or excuse me, whether or not they're going to fire him or keep him around in some way, shape, or form. Um, it's hard to see how they can keep him. I, I just don't see that happening. Uh, and I'd be surprised if they did uh, decide to keep him because with all this going around, it's just a real a real challenge to, to continue to have players who will put their trust, and not only players, but parents who will put their trust into this person and say, hey, are you going to provide a good opportunity for my son, not only as a player, but also as a human being? Because it's, let's be honest, that's the whole reason why I didn't get to play football. Because I don't think my parents trusted the coaches enough to say, okay, we're not going to go out there and we're not going to beat your son to death and try and convince him that he's something that he's not. So, you know, it's a crazy culture around football, and this is a prime example of that. An even worse example of the crazy culture around football is this whole scenario that's erupted around Urban Meyer and the Ohio State program. Urban may or may not have known about one of his assistant coaches being involved in domestic disputes in a, uh, of a violent fashion or of a violent nature with his now ex-wife, I believe. Just a terrible set of circumstances in that you, you have to wonder, okay, well, what was Urban supposed to have done if he knew about it? Was he supposed to have gone to authorities? Was he supposed to have gone to an administrator and say, hey, we got a guy on my staff who is beating his wife? And there's that sort of bond of brotherhood that says, okay, I don't say anything about this because this guy's my buddy. But then at the same time, there's that ounce of humanity that you have to have in there when you say, this guy is beating a woman. That doesn't happen. And of course, yes, you have to say something to someone if you know about it. That's my opinion anyway. So for the fact that Urban may or may not have come forward with any information he had, considering his wife knew about it, again, is this a fireable offense? Did he do something legally out of place? Not really. But at the same time, yeah, he kind of did. So, well, maybe not legally, but definitely morally. So if you want to fire somebody on the grounds of being immoral in their judgment, I'd say you've got grounds for him to be gone and for certain for DJ Durkin to be gone for Maryland. So we still got a couple of weeks to see what happens with these two in leading up to the college football season. This has happened real late in the game for these two programs to be without coaches, but it could happen. Uh, you have situations like this erupt to where, you know, not just for reasons of these that we've discussed, but for various things to where a program does not have a coach. Just like, you know, a couple of years ago, South Carolina suddenly didn't have a coach. Whatever Steve Spurrier decided, up, oh, I'm done. So it happens, and we'll have to see how this affects these two programs going forward because maybe not so much in the case of Maryland, but definitely in the case of Ohio State, they were a perennial powerhouse. So we'll have to see what exactly this does for them going forward here into the 2018 season. Ah, Got some football talk in there, and I'm sure we'll do that more as the football season progresses. Hopefully we'll have positive things to talk about whenever the football season kicks off here and the Gamecocks start winning some games. Or if they start losing some games, I'll still probably talk about them and how frustrated I am with that daggum team of mine. But at any rate, 
Appreciate you guys continuing to hang out and to tune in with us here on the Weekly Trim. We're going to take one more musical break here, and then we'll be back to have our normal closing segment of What's Red Beer Drinking? Stay tuned. everybody thank you for hanging out this long with us here on the weekly trim podcast i am your host Redbeard, and we are going to wrap up this episode of the show with our customary sign off this is our last segment where we like to have a little moment where i can describe to you an experience with what i happen to be drinking at this moment in time i am uh, i'm not an alcoholic <laughs> but we do like to have a nice little adult beverage here occasionally, and especially when I'm recording this show. Um, it's been, I'll say, a long day. We've had a good weekend here, but it's been a long day for sure. And just you know, wanted to have something a little bit out of our normal, I'll say, combination of stuff. We usually have like a beer or whatnot to, uh, to 
to talk about here in this segment, but this here is a bit of a different thing. This is the Smirnoff Ice Smash. Uh, I'm not sure where in the world the Smash came from in terms of describing this as a, a beverage, but the Smirnoff Ice Smash Peach Mango flavor. Uh, this comes in at 8% ABV and is described on the Smirnoff website as being a bold fusion of peach and mango flavors that brings you a smash hit for wherever you go, conveniently in a can. Okay, canning suddenly became convenient in 2018. Um, this, you know, it's a malt beverage, so we're going to see what this thing's all about here. I've had it in the chill chest, and this here again was a item that we procured from our local vendor, which is, of course, here in St. Matthew, South Carolina, is the BP station on Highway 6 as you head out of town towards Columbia. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's crack this thing open here and see what it's all about. I can get my fingernails under this thing. I have short fingernails, so it's always a time getting these things open. But here we go. Oh, yeah. Got that one popped open there pretty good. And this is a smaller can than what we've usually been getting here. We've been normally getting the, the cans that were the size of a, like a full loco or whatnot. This is a smaller serving size here. So what maybe, um, you know, wouldn't get quite as good of a buzz off of this one. This is a pint, 16 ounces. Um, so let's go ahead and give this a air aroma test, see if we can get any kind of a sense of what the experience will be. Definitely the most bold part of this is the peach uh, aroma, the peach scent there. Getting Yeah, definitely getting a lot of that peach flavor whenever I go in and put the nose to this uh, can. That uh, it really it brings to mind, because we, we grow a lot of peaches here in South Carolina, and we uh, are actually, you know, Georgia is called the peach state. Technically, South Carolina grows more peaches than Georgia does, but we're, we'll let you guys hold on to whatever you got there. Um, but we eat a lot of peaches here in South Carolina, and of course, whenever you bite into a big, juicy, fresh peach, your nose almost can't help but get in there and get some of that juice on there. So you, of course, get the, the delicious scent of those peaches as well. And that's uh, kind of what I'm getting whenever I put the, the nose to the can here. So let's give this a shot, and we'll see what this actually tastes like. I'm a big fan of peaches and mango, so I'm looking forward to this, even though it, it's a it's a girly, frou-frou pink can. I will say that right now. But it, it is what it is. If it tastes good, I really don't care. You can call me whatever you want to. I'll enjoy my pink beverage and not have to have a puckered mouth that, like you do while you're drinking your double IPA over there. So <laughs> it's just me engaging a little bit of, of beer trash talking there. But let's see what this thing tastes like. Wow. That is almost entirely peach in terms of the flavor. And I've got this one good and ice cold. And man, this is very very good um not overly sweet that's something that i like about this in that a lot of these a lot of these malt beverages of this nature they tend to be overwhelmingly sweet this one here is not bad at all in terms of the uh the initial punch there some of these things you, you get them and they're so sweet that it's like Ugh, where's where's my insulin i need i need an injection because you had a, a bout with diabetes as a result of trying to drink them this is very much more subtle um very smooth you don't have that malty um, sort of weird flavor that comes with some of these beverages because like with the Four Locos in particular, you have that kind of, um, it's not bitter, it's not it's not really anything other than that's just sort of foulness that comes with a malt beverage. I hate to say it, but that's the only thing I can really think of to use in describing it. But um, this is very enjoyable. I'm going to go in for another taste here and see if we pick up anything else as far as maybe a little bit more of the mango or if the peach continues to be the prevailing flavor. It's taking a moment to let it sit on my tongue there. It's still mostly peach. There is some mango to this, but my palate is picking up mostly the peach flavor there. But again, very smooth. And I've got this one, as I said, ice cold. So, man, this is a good experience. This is, again, something that, like, on a hot night, if you were out on your back deck or out in your yard enjoying a nice little um, a fire pit session or whatnot, this would be great to have. This is a nice, refreshing beverage that anybody can drink. 
And yes, it's got a nice frou-frou pink and orange and slightly yellow can that I will gladly hold in my hand and enjoy because this is a nice beverage. And yeah, I would step, I would definitely drink this again. This is good stuff. Now, I will say, when I was back, you know, back in my younger years in college, whenever Smirnoff Ice first debuted, I will say, I will admit that I was a huge fan. I, Smirnoff Ice, it was one of those things where it's like, okay, I'll drink a beer if I have to, but this just tastes better than a beer. And the same thing goes with this here. Now, this, I'll say this, I enjoy beer. I like the way beer tastes. But sometimes you just want something that doesn't taste like you're chewing on copper pennies or whatnot. It just, you know, you want something that's a little different than that. And this is definitely in that ballpark here. This is a, a very good beverage. And I would definitely recommend it to anybody who might want to try one. So here again, the Smirnoff Ice Smash Peach and Mango flavor definitely gets high marks from me. I think they've got a few other uh, flavors of this out there. Um, this was the only one that I saw at the store that I bought this can from. However, um, definitely check it out. Definitely uh, give it a shot there. Wow, I'm going to enjoy this beverage, and I'm going to have a good rest of my evening. You folks, please do the same. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for tuning in. And please remember to like, comment, share, and subscribe if you're interested in continuing to be a part of the community that we're building here on the Rassel of Redbeard YouTube channel. This has been another episode of The Weekly Trim. We'll see you down.